Hello and welcome to the second to the last week of the course. This week we are going to cover three chapters in the book, chapters 20, 21, and 22. These are going to cover the areas of biotechnology, bioinformatics, and bioethics. So just to begin with, when we're talking about things like cloning, recombinant DNA, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page of what we're talking about, I'd like to give you a little background here. So first of all, recombinant DNA refers to the joining of DNA molecules. These can be from different biological sources. Um, they're not typically found together in nature. So you can take genes from one organism and put them into a different organism to study them or to express them for different reasons. So the basic way that you're going to do this is you're going to cut the DNA using enzymes called restriction enzymes. These will cut the DNA at very specific sequences. These fragments are then joined together and placed into a vector. This is a, um, a way to transfer these molecules around or to get them to be expressed in different organisms. Uh, and then it's put into the host cell, whether that's a bacteria, or whether it's a um, mammalian cell, or whatever type of cell. And it will produce many copies that can then be recovered from that host cell. Anytime we have copy of something, in this case we're having copies of this DNA, this recombinant DNA, we refer to it as a clone. And we can use this then to study the structure of the DNA, the orientation of the DNA, uh, and then the function and structure of the, of the protein products. This recombinant DNA technology is used to isolate, replicate, and analyze genes. So when we're talking about restriction enzymes, we're talking about enzymes that are going to cut the DNA at very specific sequences. These are going to be proteins. Um, and they're typically, what we think that they arose from was from bacteria that were trying to protect themselves from invading viruses. And we can see that because of the, most of these are isolated from microorganisms. What we can see from most of these restriction enzymes, and what's useful for to us, is that they're going to cut this DNA on an angle. So what happens after this restriction is you'll have these ends, these overlapping ends, you can see here's another one. Okay, again, it's going to cut like this. Let me pull this apart. Some of them will cut with blunt ends and not necessarily with the sticky ends or cohesive ends. Um, but ideally, when we're doing these types of restriction enzymes uh, in the lab, you're going to select something that will give you these sticky ends. And that's because it's going to make your cloning much easier. And we'll talk more about why that is in just a minute. So most of these um, restriction enzymes are going to form, uh, exhibit a form of symmetry known as a palindrome. What that means is that they're going to read the same forwards and backwards. And restriction enzymes are going to be specific for this characteristic cleavage pattern. Let me go back and show you. So in the case of Hindi, um, or BAMH1, what you can see is it's going to read the same forwards and backwards. So in Hindi, A-A-G-C-T-T. And here you can see the A-A-G-C-T-T. -T. Okay. The BAMH1, same thing. Okay. These other enzymes, same thing. Most of these enzymes are going to have um, sites of recognition sites of about four to six nucleotides. These are probably two of the most commonly used um, for cloning techniques. There's a few others that are very commonly used as well. The reason for this is because you want something that is going to be specific for your cut site um, if you use some of these that have these smaller recognition sites, it might cut at unexpected areas. You also don't want it to be too long because that can be somewhat cumbersome when you're trying to do cloning. Um, over 3,000 restriction enzymes have been identified and studied, and more than 600 of them are available commercially. So pretty much any sequence that you need, um, that's within this four to six base pair range, maybe a little bit longer range, you can cut using if you purchase and buy this specific restriction enzyme. They are primarily found in bacteria and archaea, and we think that they provide a wonderful defense mechanism against invading viruses that we've been able to sort of hijack and use for our purposes. So what we can do is we can purify these restriction enzymes from the bacteria or from the archaea, um, and then use them for different types of reactions. Another incredibly important enzyme is ligase, DNA ligase. DNA ligase will seal ends of DNA together. So in the case of cloning, 
when we cut with an enzyme, um, such as the BAMH1 or the Hindi uh, or EcoR1, it's going to leave these sticky ends. When you um, uh, use DNA ligase, what DNA ligase is going to do is it's going to help to seal these ends. These ends may be able to find one another. They may, able, may be able to bind one another through hydrogen bonding. However, this backbone right here, um, you can see, and then right here, you can see between the A's and the G's, is not sealed. That backbone, that sugar phosphate backbone, is not sealed between these two nucleotides. So DNA ligase is required to seal that backbone so that those two strands cannot become um, separated again. Vectors are very important for this process as well. Vectors are going to be the carrier DNA molecules that can replicate your cloned DNA fragments in whatever host cell that you're looking to express them in. Um, these vectors are going to have several characteristics, um, such as they must be able to replicate independently, particularly independently of whatever that chromosome is within chromosome or chromosomes within those host cells. They also, to make ease of cloning, um, should have several restriction enzyme sites so that you can insert d different DNA fragments. Most of these vectors will contain these um, restriction sites that are going to contain maybe four to six to eight restriction sites. So whatever happens to be compatible with your DNA, you can place into these various different vectors. Vectors also need to be able to carry a selectable gene marker. The reason for this is because you need to be able to distinguish these cells, these host cells that have taken up the vector versus those that have not. The most common type of vector that we'll see is called a plasmid. We've talked about that previously. Plasmids are just these extra chromosomal, somewhat small, double-stranded DNA molecules. They'll replicate independently from the chromosomes, and we find these in bacteria cells. There are many of these plasmids that are commercially available. Um, there are different websites you can go to and literally purchase them for, depending on the price, some of them are, are more expensive than others, but maybe around a hundred bucks. Um, I wouldn't expect to pay more than a thousand dollars if it was a really special one for some reason, and you might be able to get them even free if you happen to know somebody who's working in a lab that has these, or very inexpensive expensive costs at least. Um, the ones that are used very commonly are going to have a number of convenient restriction sites, and they're going to have this marker gene to select for its presence in the host cell. So here's an example of a plasmid. It's going to have this multiple cloning site. So right here you can see within this site all of these different uh, restriction sites are located here. So there's literally books. You can go out, you can look to see where, what are the cut sites of all of these different fragments, and you can see what is compatible with your particular gene that you'd like to place within these. There are cases where none of these sites may be compatible, and there are ways to get around that. Um, however, for the most part, you can usually find a site that will work for what you want to clone into here. In this case, there's also an ampicillin resistance gene, and what this means is that you can add ampicillin to the culture media, and only the host cells that have taken up this plasmid should be able to grow. That ampicillin should kill anything that is um, not taken up this particular plasmid. This one has an additional marker. Here we can see the LAC-Z gene, uh, and has a multiple cloning site within here. So what happens, this LAC-Z gene, is when you put the, a particular substrate in here, it will make these colonies look blue. When you disrupt this gene by inserting something within this region here, it can no longer make this blue, and so these colonies will look white if you look at them on a petri plate. So it's very easy um, to look to see, okay, well maybe, maybe these cells have evolved resistance, and maybe they are able to grow even in the presence of ampicillin. If they are blue, you know that that would be the case. Okay, so you want to try to pick colonies that would only be white. Um, there's also some sequencing sites. Um, this here happens to be the origin of replication, and so on. Okay, so what's going to happen? Okay, well, we've got our plasmid vector. We've cut it with the restriction enzyme. We've cut the DNA that we want to clone with that same restriction enzyme or enzymes that happen to be compatible. You're going to ligate them into your vector, in this case the plasmid. You will introduce them into the host cells by transformation. Transformation typically is accomplished by using compet what's known as competent cells. These cells, um, if you heat them and then basically do a heat shock to them, they will take up nearby plasmids. 
and it's a very simple process. It takes, you know, just a few minutes really, um, and then incubating these cells in an incubator. Then uh, once this has happened, then you can select for the cells containing this particular plasmid by plating them on medium containing your antibiotics as well as the co color indicators, the blue-white indicators. Um, so this is a, just a little bit additional information about that LAC-Z. In this case here is the LAC-C. You can see when you cut this, um, this is going to disrupt this gene function. You've cloned something in. Now this recombinant plasmid cannot metabolize x -gal. It's going to form this white colony. So if you're looking at these on a plate, this may be difficult to see, but some of these little colonies are blue, some of them are white. When you were selecting for a clone to test, you would want to select one, one or ones that are the white color, not this blue color. There are other vectors that are useful as well. Um, viruses are one example of this. Uh, Lambda phage um, is a virus that's going to be infecting um, usually bacteria, E. coli, and they can carry, carry quite a bit of clone DNA, so up to 45 kilobyte bases of the clone DNA. Plasmids are much smaller, usually you can clone in maybe about maybe 1 kb, 2 kb, maybe max, um, so they're quite a bit smaller. Again, these lambda vectors can carry quite a bit more. There are other ways as well, um, bacterial artificial chromosomes like BACs or yeast artificial chromosomes like YAKs, um, they can be very, very large, but they can be very low in copy number. So you might only get one to two copies per bacteria cell or, or yeast cell of these particular plasmids. The plasmids you can get, um, even the low copy plasmids, maybe 100 copies per cell, you might be able to get as many as 1,000 copies per cell for these. There are other viruses that can be used as well. Baculoviruses are viruses that will infect insect cells, and they are often used for things that are going to be um, eukaryotic gene expression. When we're expressing genes in bacterial cells, we may not get all of the modifications that are required. If you remember, eukaryotic cells will often do many different types of modifications, post-translational modifications, to these proteins. And sometimes these modifications need to happen before these proteins can be fully active. Well, many of these cannot occur within these bacteria cells. They simply don't have the machinery for it. So by being able to express them in baculoviruses or insect viruses, we're able to express them in eukaryotic cells. And they are able to do many of these modifications that might be required for the full protein activity. So um, this whole process is pretty universal. We can take cells from um, any organism and we can express engineer them to express foreign genes. You can use human cell lines and you can use them to express any gene that you're interested in. You can take plants, engineer them to express foreign genes. And in fact, many of the plants that are available today are going to be genetically modified. It's something like uh, 95 to 98 percent of corn and soybean in this country are genetically modified. Cotton, very highly genetically modified as well. Potato, also very um, predominantly genetically modified. So we'll talk more about that later. Yeast, also used to express foreign genes. Yeast are, remember, a model eukaryotic system. And so we can use them to study many things, many eukaryotic genes, very, very easily and almost as easily as studying them in bacteria cells.